we're very excited today. Uh, we have someone who's hired a lot of our graduates, so that's always a really good thing. Um, I want to welcome to TCU Barry Salzberg, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte. Um, Barry Salzberg was elected as CEO of Deloitte uh, in June of 2007, after serving as the U.S. Managing Partner from 2003 to 2007. He's also a member of Deloitte's U.S. Board of Directors, the Deloitte Tuch Tematsu Global Executive Committee, and the DTT Global Board of Directors. He's a member of the New York State Bar Association, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, the New York State Society of Certified Public Accountants, and the New York County Lawyers Association. He's a board member of business organizations, including the Center for Audit Quality, Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, and the Partnership for New York. He's an advisor to the G100, advisory board member of International Business Leaders Forum, and an international counselor to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's known in the marketplace for his commitment to building opportunities for tomorrow's leaders and fostering diversity within the workplace. Mr. Sal Salzberg serves as a board member for, of College Summit and Vanderbilt University School of Management. He's the chair of the Capital Steering Committee for the YMCA of Greater New York. He received his undergraduate degree in accounting from Brooklyn College, his JD from Brooklyn Law School, and his LLM in taxation from the New York University School of Law. It's our privilege to welcome Barry Salzberg. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you had a vote in the uh, football, college football poll, we'd start there. Um, I'm wearing my purple tie. <laughs> we like that very much. Uh, why don't we start and learn a little bit about you. Tell us a little bit about your background and where you came from and how you got to be where you are now. So uh, I've been, um, uh, first off, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a lifer with Deloitte. Uh, I started in 1977 uh, right out of law school. Uh, in the tax practice. Prior to that, uh, I lived and worked uh, part-time jobs in New York City. I, I'm a Brooklyn boy, uh, and uh, I was telling someone earlier, uh, I've now, from 77 to 2010, 33 years with Deloitte, I've not moved uh, for us uh, ever, although I was asked to move several times. But I, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, uh, counting by, by degree in uh, undergraduate school. Went to law school, started with Deloitte in 1977 in New York, uh, and have been there ever since. Our headquarters now are in New York, both U.S. and global, uh, and uh, have been uh, now celebrating my 33rd year and looking to get at least five more. Wow. What was your first job? Tell us about that. How did you get started in the world? Uh, well, uh, my first full-time job was Deloitte. I mean, that's as shocking as, as that is, but I did some part-time uh, work when I was going to to school to be able to afford uh, living uh, at the time. Uh, I was a messenger uh, for uh -huh. a travel agent, but, but I was also a payroll clerk for the New York City Board of Education. Uh, huh. I, um, I basically paid the teachers. I mean, my job was to calculate whatever a teacher got a raise, uh, to calculate what that raise was, and then uh, input it into the, into the very sophisticated technology system that the New York City Board of Education had at the time, and then uh, retroactively pay them to the date that they were entitled to that rate. And then, and then, uh, I was actually the deliverer of those paychecks, uh, get into a car, and, and those days, no such thing as direct deposit. I mean, these were hard checks. And, wow. and, and the way the, the, the teachers uh, wanted, uh, it was uh, hand delivered. And so you went from uh, district to district dropping off these massive payroll checks, and, and I did that uh, as well. So I was the driver. I had a, a, a co-employee with me who, when I pulled up to the school, he went out, uh, went into the school, and very often he needed armed guards to do that, but mm -hmm. uh, went in and <coughs> delivered it, and we went back. That was my... Wow. So I had two part-time jobs. Yeah. I had the messenger and then uh, New York City Board of Education. Yeah, Brian Gutierrez, you might think about that model. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about maybe mentors in your life. Are there people that have made a difference that you have learned from and yeah. what have you learned? Um, so I, I think over a, a period of years you have multiple mentors. So I, I don't think I could look back over my 33 years with, with Deloitte and say I've had one mentor. Uh, I've had multiple and, and, and it depends on the stage and where uh, in my career development I was. But, 
The one that I remember the most uh, was, was a, a senior partner uh, that I worked with for a number of years. He took a liking to me, believed that I had the potential to do more than what I was doing at the time, which was I was a tax partner uh, at, at Deloitte and serving uh, tax clients in the personal tax area, partnership tax area, particularly my clients were investment banking firms and law firms and high net worth individuals. Anyway, so he took a liking to me uh, and, and he would mentor me. Um, and, and the rapport was good, the chemistry was right, uh, and the receptivity of me to him and his interest and passion to help me, that was a, a great combination. And he was, um, was really fabulous. And, and, and I'll tell you just a little story. When I was uh, uh, in tax, my aspiration was to remain in tax. My aspiration was to continue to serve clients' uh, tax needs. And that's what I went into business for. That's what I enjoyed doing. I had a passion for client service. And he said to me one day, he says, I'd like to position you for your next job. And I said, OK, and what do you think that next job is? And he said, I'd like you to move out of tax and sort of run an office. Uh, which would include audit, tax, consulting at the time. And, and I said, you know, Bill, I, I really don't understand that. I'm a tax guy. I'd rather kind of lead a tax practice if I'm going to lead anything. And I appreciate your, your confidence, but why left instead of right? And he said, trust me, uh, it's good for you, good exposure. And I had confidence in him as a mentor. And I said, mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, so I went left, uh, and I ran this uh, little group. And then four years later, uh, when it was time for him to move on to his next job, which he did, he then said to me, I'd like you to uh, be the national leader for tax now. And I looked at him quite quizzically. I said, you know, I don't get it. You told me tax, and now you, you move me into this broader role. Now I have an interest in this broader role. I'd like to be a bigger, bigger in this broader role. <laughs> so what, what, are you, what are you doing? And he said to me, trust me, you need to move back uh, into national kind of p and role, uh, uh -huh. uh, which, which I did. I, I, I had huge confidence in him. I didn't understand why at the time. And, and then as I was considered by my partners to lead the firm, those experiences turned out to be really critical. Uh -huh. And the performance that I was able to deliver uh, in each of those roles also uh, high enough that my partners elected me. I am confident I would not be sitting here today in the seat that I enjoy if I didn't have a mentor who helped me migrate my career path with experiences that I probably would not have even believed I could do, yet alone want to do, given the background that I had. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I tell uh, uh, folks all the time the importance of mentorship, the importance of, of having someone that, you know, you have that rapport, that chemistry, mm -hmm. that you could actually have the confidence in the advice that they're giving so that when you take it, you feel that you're getting good, sound, uh, career advice. Now, this was just one. You know, over the course of my career preceding him, I had multiple, and today I have mentors too because he's now retired, and I don't interact with him. He's a client, which is probably the best scenario to be in. But uh, I I use other people sure. now to mentor. You never stop needing a mentor. I don't care where in the organization you are. It's always good to get that independent, thoughtful advice. You know, all of us in our professional lives have had ups and downs. Uh, can you talk maybe what, what was one of your big up, one of your big accomplishments that you had in life? You know, uh, first off, I've got two wonderful kids, uh, and one graduated from Harvard, one graduated from Columbia. Uh, they're both wonderful kids. I'm just delighted with where they are in life, so I knock on wood every day, to, uh, and, and to some degree as a parent, that's an accomplishment, I guess. Uh, in, in the business sense, clearly becoming CEO of the world's largest professional services firm is pretty darn exciting uh, and an accomplishment, particularly given my background, uh, being in Brooklyn, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, being a tax guy, and being a lawyer. Um, I think all three are firsts for a CEO of, of Deloitte. So I, I feel pretty accomplished and sure. particularly privileged to be in that seat. Um, but if you said take business now and take one thing that you've done, um, I, I would have to say last year, May of a year ago, um, we made our largest acquisition ever in the midst of the worst economic environment ever. Uh, and it was hugely successful for us. Uh, Deloitte purchased the federal consulting 
business of Bearing Point out of bankruptcy uh, at a time when uh, anyone was really looking to squeeze cash, not looking to spend cash, uh, and, and growing in a, in, a, in a consulting business that in an environment, uh, typically, although federal consulting is growing because of, at that time the nature of the spend in our federal government so uh, anticipated to be so high, consulting spend is pretty good, but, but it was pretty risky proposition. Um, and, and it has turned out to be a home run for us. It was immediately accretive to our partners. Uh, growth rate is double digit on top of the acquisition growth that comes uh, with it since it wasn't in our base. Mm -hmm. And we added about $800 million of revenue uh, from it. Um, it was a huge ROI for us and, and people from that company now fully integrated into our organization and are very successful. So having led that, uh, I would say that, you know, singularly, if you looked at the transaction, you know, something mm -hmm. that occurred in my professional life, I would say that that was uh, the most accomplishment, the, the highest accomplishment that I have. Yeah, this is a real special morning. We've got a room full of Texas accents and Brooklyn accent. I mean, this is pretty amazing <laughs> in one place. Well, I can try so. to get Texas accent, but it won't work pretty well. Yeah. Let's turn I've got a Texas hat. But yeah. <laughs> Let's turn to the Texas, or to Texas, we are here. Let's turn to the company a little bit and talk about Deloitte. So who is Deloitte? So we are uh, a professional services firm. Uh, we do audits of, of private and public companies. Uh, we do tax advice. We do consulting. Uh, our consulting business, in fact, uh, is our largest single business within Deloitte. Uh, and, and if you, you might remember, for those of you the study of the professional services organizations, back when Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted, uh, companies had a choice. You either got rid of your consulting business because you needed to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley, or you segmented your firm and made sure that while you still had consulting, you, um, you don't run afoul of, of the Sarbanes-Oxley scope of services prohibitions. Ultimately, we chose the latter route, uh, and it's turned out to be strategically very valuable for us. So today, we have a consulting business that is, as I said, the largest in our mm -hmm. firm of all of our businesses, and it's a business that has over 95% of its revenue from uh, clients that are not audit clients because you have to make sure that the prohibited services that are, that are uh, identified in Sarbanes-Oxley are not provided to an audit client um, uh, at all and a lot of what consulting does is. So we've been able to morph our consulting business to address a space that uh, consulting can play in uh, and it's become our largest business. And so we're a $10 billion U.S. business, $26.5 billion global business, uh, focus on those three broad areas, uh, and, and this year became the largest professional services firm uh, in the world. Um, it, it previously, PwC was there, uh, and, and we're pretty much identical in size, but whenever you can, you take advantage of the statistic that works in your favor. At a $26.5 <laughs> billion dollar business, each of us, we're $9 million bigger, and that's okay. <laughs> So your, your offices in different locations, they emphasize different areas? Uh, every office pretty much has the full uh, scope of services that I just identified. Mm -hmm. But in consulting in particular, uh, we operate more <coughs> in, by scale uh, and center of excellence than we necessarily would in audit and tax. So pretty much all of our offices would have audit and tax. Most of our offices would have consulting. But consulting is a very uh, mobile uh, business and it's very common for us to serve clients anywhere uh, with professionals who have the competency irrespective of where they may reside uh, mm -hmm. and so as a result of that uh, we don't have consulting competencies in every office but certainly in our larger offices and certainly uh, in those markets that buy consulting services will have consulting expertise. Okay. So what makes Deloitte different? I mean, How do you differentiate yourself from the competition? There's a lot of consultants in the world yeah, um, I think two things. Um, one is our business model. Uh, if you look at the big four for the moment, uh, their consulting business is uh, small, much smaller than us. And remember when I said earlier that we decided to go on that second route, segment our client base, the other three big four firms went the first route. They sold off their consulting businesses. 
So for a period of time, we were the only big four with a consulting business. And now each of the other three are building up their consulting business once their non-competes expired. And the business model suggests that those competencies are not only good to have in terms of business, but in terms of adding value to the audit. Um, and so uh, right now, while they're in the consulting business, we're really in the consulting business, and they're beginning to grow. So one unique feature that we think is very differentiating for Deloitte uh, is our business model and the breadth of the services that we provide. Uh, and so if you look at the big four, we've got consulting. Now if you switch to the consulting firms, they don't have what we have in audit and tax and some of our other uh, uh, disciplines uh, with, within, uh, within the firm. And so an example would be Accenture, we, com we compete against regularly for technology implementations and, and, and uh, uh, systems work. Well, uh, our, uh, when Accenture bids against us, they don't have tax people. And, and their ability to provide tax advice commensurate with the nature of the ERP systems work that they're getting is nowhere near like ours. So when you look at who we compete against, they don't have all the skills and disciplines that we have. And so unique feature number one is our broad portfolio. Number two is we are a partnership. Most of our competitors are partnership. Most of them are private like we are. But none of them in our view, of course it's a, it's a biased point of view, have the kind of culture that we have. We are very partnership oriented, uh, consensus oriented, team, team environment. Uh, grassroots kind of input all the time, free dissent. Um, and trust me as a CEO, I know. We have 3,000 partners and there are 3,000 views on every subject. Um, but, but we have the culture that, that you know, brings out the best uh, in, in that respect. And I think it's, it's very different. We hear it time and time again from our clients in terms of how we interact with them. They see that culture, they see that, that, that teaming and and environment. We're not a command and control organization. And when we talk with clients, that actually does matter. It is differentiating. So those would be the two things mm -hmm. that I would pick. Uh, it would be the <coughs> business model and our culture. Let's build on that corporate culture a little bit. I, years ago when I was in Cincinnati, I got to know the Deloitte folks there. And the two things that struck me there were the flexible work schedule, being in the office back on Friday, uh, and the opportunities for women that you really built into the workplace. Why don't you could you talk a little bit about kind of the corporate responsibility, the culture, and how Deloitte got to be there and what you're doing now in those areas? So if you go back uh, to the uh, 80s, uh, Deloitte had 70, 70 women uh, partners and directors, 70. Today we have about 1,100. Uh, and that, that evolution was by intent by, by work, I mean, we really worked hard at creating the culture, creating the, uh, the, the environment, the accountability, the, 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 the targets and the metrics associated with it. Uh, and, and I think as a result, we were pretty well known in the marketplace for our commitment to the advancement and retention of women. And subsequently mm -hmm. to that, furthering that to the advancement and retention of minorities uh, and creating an inclusive uh, workforce. Uh, so I, I think that today, that's part of corporate social responsibility. Clearly when people talk about CSR, uh, it is a, an integral component of it. Uh, but then, uh, it was an all white male organization, pretty much. And, and the evolution that we've been able to uh, really drive uh, is very, very positive. Uh, it requires flexibility, so an emphasis on uh, balancing work and life. Uh, our, our leader within the firm uh, is now an author of what now is the second book on this subject. And I encourage you, if you really care about this topic, uh, you, you should just take the time. It's a, it's a quick read of a book. The, it, it's about mass career customization, which, which is what we're calling our focus on workplace uh, uh, flexibility. It's being able to customize individual careers to match their own trajectory and their own personal circumstances so as to encourage people to drive their career planning in a way that fits their personal needs and circumstances and to create an internal culture where you don't have to climb the corporate ladder like we used to. 
Uh, in the old days, when I started growing, you know, started with the firm, it was an up or out kind of mentality, and it was a straight curve right up the ladder. The philosophy that we've created, that's copyrighted to Deloitte, is this mass career customization where we're focusing on something that we're now calling the corporate <coughs> lattice instead of the corporate ladder, where you can go up and you have a personal issue, whether it's having a child, taking care of an older relative, pick whatever you want, um, that you can then go across, and then when you're ready to resume your career, you can then go back up. Hmm. And, and, and we're, we're pretty well known for it, uh, to the point where when these books were published, the volume of press that we got, as well as the client interaction, we said, could you help us implement this uh, in our organization, has been pretty high. Um, and so we're totally committed to it um, and constantly innovate to figure out how best to deal with it. Let me, let me tell you that the young kids today are different than, than we are. Um, and, and to be able to create a work environment that, that, that plays to who they are and what they need, as well as the three other generations of people that are still in the workforce is no small undertaking. But it all fits into this flexibility uh, concept and something that we really do have to continue to, to, to focus on. Uh, what, what a person out of college wants and needs today is so different than what I want and need. And we have to adapt to a culture that plays to everyone. So again, workplace flexibility is key to, to who we are and, and, and drives it. And if you think of, of you, you talked about it being part of, of corporate social responsibility, I will tell you today, when you're recruiting on campus and, and you want to uh, uh, be the firm that that individual recruit wants to work for, you have to have a commitment to CSR and you have to demonstrate that commitment in action. The kids today have on their top three list of what factors they look at in assessing which company to work for, CSR, and that includes uh, 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 win in diversity, in, in the words mm -hmm. of, of Deloitte. It includes community involvement. It includes greening. It includes all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so an organization that doesn't walk that talk will miss the, the high talent uh, in the moment. They'll go somewhere else. That means we have to prepare students for that as well. So that's on the input side. So does all this make a difference? How do you know? You're in the auditing business. How do you know whether all this makes a difference? Well, uh, it makes a difference uh, in the volume of people that you hire. Mm -hmm. The demand is right now, fortunately, the economy has turned somewhat. We're cautious about it, by the way, so we're not entirely sure where it will continue to go. But Deloitte is growing at 9% right now. And growing 9% mm -hmm. in this environment, which Short. is a good thing, by the way, um, it, it also suggests that you need more people. You can't possibly serve demand plus 9% with the same number of people that you had before. So you have to recruit. Uh, getting those recruits is a metric that, that will define whether or not our CSR matters. Because I know it's important to them and they're very, very careful in their selection process. Second is retention. Uh, if when they join you, you don't then walk the talk, they'll walk with their feet. Uh, and so you need to be sure that we're continuously providing an environment that meets there, and, and while in an environment like today, attrition increases for sure, no matter what you do, um, keeping it in tow and keeping the high performers in particular is another way to, to show that it matters. Um, so we, we, we look at all of that. The changing demographics of our country is such today that the number of minorities that will be in the workforce in, in 10 years from now is significantly greater than what we have today. And if you're not uh, creating that environment of, of a commitment to CSR, which would include uh, uh, an inclusive and, and um, uh, friendly environment, you won't attract those people tomorrow. You won't have role models that they will look to that will say, okay, I wanna go work for that firm. Mm -hmm. and, and so we'll miss out, and, and this is an issue that I have with Deloitte right now. Our, our people are looking at today because they, the demand is high, the environment is intense, and they're not thinking you know, 10 years out, but I'm worried in 10 years, the, 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 the labor pool will be so different and so 
uh, wanting of a certain kind of environment that if we don't create it now, it'll be too late then. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that'll show that it'll matter. So it's, that's a future, will it matter? Mm -hmm. And I, I think the answer okay. is yes. Interesting. We want to open it to the audience for questions, but let me ask one more first. I know you're opening a lear kind of learning facility, corporate headquarters, uh, in Westlake, in Lyons area. Why are you doing that? What's that going to be about? And what it's, how's that going to matter for all of us in North Texas? Well, um, it, it's in many ways a full employment act for Westlake, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> it will be the biggest thing there. Um, a couple of thoughts. First is, um, we concluded very, very uh, uh, intently that culture, brand recognition, development of our people, um, and creating a teeming environment on a sustainable basis was critical to us. So put that in bucket one. In bucket two, I was telling uh, some of the folks there at breakfast, um, one day, a number, a couple of years ago, three years ago, four years ago, I forget when it was, I asked our, our, uh, our team, our HR team, to, to help me understand the learning and development budget that we had. And it was doubling, almost doubling from the prior year. And I asked them, uh, why? Because if it doubled because we're training more people, that'd be cool. If it doubled because we had more courses to give the same number of people, that would be cool. And they said to me, no. I said, well, what was the reason? It says the cost of conference facilities was doubling. And so when we went out to train our existing people, the same location, the cost of the conference, the food, the was, was, so I said, well, that's not getting the biggest bank for our buck, so we ought to rethink it. So now, converge the two thoughts, and out from a very long uh, process came our commitment to creating our own learning and development center, building it from scratch, a singular premise where a substantial amount of learning and development for our people, once they join us, will occur. Not all. Um, and, and we went through a very thoughtful selection process of where it should be. Um, I was telling uh, our, our table that uh, we picked the center of the country uh, so that now for sure my entire firm is unhappy with me. And so I know that I picked the exact right place. The, the people that are real happy are the folks that, that are in Dallas and, sure. and Fort Worth. But uh, the, the fact is we picked a fabulous location uh, right outside the airport uh, in, a, in a town called Westlake. Uh, we have 107 acres and we're building a 750,000 square foot conference center and hotel. We'll have 800 rooms so that our people, when they come for learning and development, which will be both soft skills and technical skills, industry skills and leadership development skills, when they come there, they will be there. And they will be able to together bond and work in a collaborative environment, uh, create a network, a teaming spirit, learn about Deloitte, become more loyal to Deloitte over time. They'll want to come back to, we're calling it DU, Deloitte University, uh, and be able to uh, uh, further their careers by participating in whatever event uh, we have there from a learning and development perspective. Uh, most of the training that we'll do there will be leadership development, uh, mm -hmm. will be things like building relationships with clients, uh, negotiating skills, um, things of that nature. Just think about uh, all that a professional needs to have in order to be a well-rounded, uh, outstanding leader. Um, and, and of course, there'll be technical training because foundationally, we have to have that, 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 that knowledge and that technical skills. But a lot of that will be done e-learning wise, will also be done locally, uh, but some of it will be done uh, at DU. We're, uh, we're very excited, it's about 60, 70% complete. Uh, it'll be open for business in 2011. Uh, our team that helped advise us uh, on creating this and picking the space and, and helping us through this is sitting here and I thank all of you for uh, the work that you've done for us in that regard and, and I do think that uh, uh, it's going to be a real home run uh, for us. So I'm looking forward to it opening up and uh, it'll open up and begin operating just in time for me to retire. Uh, <laughs> I look forward to, to its uh, future impact uh, on Deloitte. But you'll, they'll let you come back and talk some about it. I, I, sure, I sure hope so. Yeah, with that. And we're excited for that here. You know, this is such a great region of the country, and, exactly. and you're adding just a, what a powerful thing for us all. Let's open it to the audience, because I know a lot of folks came today and have questions for Mr. Salzberg. So. Questions? Yes? 
Sure. Uh, I was wondering what it was like in 2002 as you watched what was happening in our branch uh, at Deloitte. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was actually quite miserable, uh, frankly. Uh, no one uh, in, in our profession um, had at the time any interest uh, or support for, for what ultimately occurred at, at, at Arthur Anderson. Uh, in many ways, uh, it was wrong. In many ways, the result that occurred was unfortunate, not well thought through uh, in terms of the potential outcomes of an action that, that probably was not warranted. Uh, at least we know it wasn't warranted based upon the subsequent court uh, cases that, that had occurred. Um, and, and so it was really horrible for our profession. Um, and while Arthur Anderson was going through that, that period of time, you know, we took a, a view which uh, some but maybe not all of our competitors uh, uh, had the same view, is you lay off. Don't go after their clients. Don't go after their people. Uh, a healthier profession would, would, would be with it, Arthur Anderson, not without it. Um, but then when it started to unravel, uh, and they themselves concluded that they could not survive as an organization, um, uh, we hired and went through a very, very intense process of hiring uh, some 2,000 uh, Arthur Anderson professionals and some 200 uh, Arthur Anderson uh, partners, uh, many of whom, most of whom, are still with us today and have advanced their careers uh, within Deloitte. Uh, their tax practice uh, in particular was outstanding, uh, and we had a very high percentage of those 2,000 uh, in tax join us. Uh, and I believe that's allowed us to really be a world-class uh, tax uh, organization. And I, I feel that it was the wrong thing to have occurred. At the time, uh, we felt really, really awful. Um, and then when it unraveled, we had to take advantage of the situation or be left in the dust uh, from our competitors, uh, which we did. Uh, and, and the rest is history. It's very unfortunate that that occurred. In the back. I appreciate you talking about the mentoring that you received. There's a lot of students in here. Uh, looking back, what would you do differently when you joined the firm in seeking out mentors? And do you mentor anyone now? Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of uh, early on in my career, uh, I probably did not seek a mentor. And the reason I didn't seek a mentor is my view when I joined Deloitte was I was going to come get my CPA and leave. And so I felt there was no need for me to have a mentor within the firm. Uh, I got hooked uh, when I started you know, maturing into the practice and started liking the work that I was doing in the specialty area that I was helping drive. And so probably early on, uh, I, I guess the biggest mistake I had was to be closed-minded rather than open-minded in terms of the value that mentoring could have to me. Uh, and I guess on hindsight, I would have preferred to have a mentor earlier in my career than I ultimately did. Today, I definitely mentor lots of people. Uh, unfortunately, I don't mentor as many people as want to be mentored by me because there is a, a capacity issue. You don't want to become a mentor to anyone if you can't devote the time and the energy and the passion uh, to it. Uh, and so sometimes you have to say no, and that's the best answer to the person so that they can get somebody else to do it. But I mentor people today at the partner level and at the staff level. Uh, and and I'm, I feel very good about the impact that, that I can have, but there's a limit to how many you could mentor effectively. Uh, and so I would bet right now, if I was to guess, maybe 15 people that you know I give career guidance to and help them deal with difficult situations, position them for their future careers, like someone positioned me for my future career. Um, but I can assure you that's a small percentage of the number of people that would really like that kind of advice and counsel. Yes, Mr. Frank? Can you talk a little bit more about your statement based on between consulting and audit? Maybe give us a real example as to how you're able to leverage both the same client or similar industries. So let me go back when we were first confronted with that, uh, that, that, uh, that rule in front of us. Take a client, uh, just pick a corporate client. Probably at the time, a good example would be that if it was in a test client, consulting provided uh, uh, services to that attest client in addition to us providing a test services. 
And at that time, if I had a guess, it was about 50-50, meaning 50% 50 of the consulting revenue that we got came from attest clients, 50% of the consulting revenue that we had came from non-attest clients. We had a morph almost overnight. So you had to decline your business base in order to get going again and grow uh, as we, we reoriented our addressable market space from a test client to non attest clients. And so as I said today, we're over 95% uh, uh, non attest in consulting. And we coexist extremely well because now after you know, seven or eight years of, of the law, we know what it is. We know how to apply it. We have systems to red flag. Oops, you know, you better watch out. Somebody's doing something that you can't do because we have an integrated engagement management system. Uh, and so we, we, we very carefully uh, watch over that. Uh, and, and today, uh, the value that consulting is bringing to our audit clients is huge. Even though they're not engaged in projects like we were back then. What do I mean by that? If you're doing an audit for a client today uh, in a particular industry sector, there's, there's a great need by those clients for industry knowledge, industry best practices, what's happening uh, in that particular industry sector. Our consulting business is industry organized, and they have everyone industry focused. And so the value that they can add to the audit without engaging in a big project is really, really huge. And, mm -hmm. and that's uh, an emphasis that we have today. So that bringing consulting into an attest client um, is quite natural, but all for ideas, leadership, thought leadership, benchmarking, uh, and, and so forth. Um, and so uh, we're very, very careful. Now, I'm not as happy that, that it's 95.5 or 99.1, whatever that percentage is, because there's a whole bunch of consulting services that are not prohibited, that you can provide to an attest client. But the world has evolved such that if you're an audit committee chair, you, 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 you sort of shy away from hiring the attest firm for consulting services. You don't have to, but, but some do. Uh, and so I feel that we can get that 95.5, you know, better balanced, uh, and we have some work to do in that regard. But it is, uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity, shall we say. And, and I, I think that, you know, our business model uh, is actually, um, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. And so our, our com competition is building up their consulting business, they're hiring from us. You, you, can't, you, you can't hide it from me just because you don't call it consulting. When you're hiring our consultants, I know that you're in consulting. <laughs> so imitation is the best form of capital. You know, there's such a crisis of kind of or perceived crisis of confidence in the integrity of business. Um, do you spend, as you think about that, as you in your day, because I'm sure you're faced with that, do you approach that in uh, what you say? in how you act and how the company acts? I mean, what's, how do you think about that? Well, uh, there's no doubt about the fact that the trust level, the business confidence factors are low. They're better than it was two years ago. Right. Uh, but, but low in the absolute still. So there's work to be done by businesses of all kinds. And I think it's all about uh, culture, it's all about values, it's all about reinforced messaging. Um, and, and, and I always uh, use the phrase when I talk to our people, uh, be on the right side of right. And I, I always say something like, you know, think about what we're doing, and if it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, uh, what would your mother say? Mm -hmm. and, and reinforce that kind of messaging uh, to, to really develop uh, an environment that tries to build up that trustworthiness uh, and, and the uh, respect that, that a business uh, like ours or any other business really commands. Unfortunately, what happens in the world that we've been in, this is my personal view, uh, the, 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 we're all penalized for the ac actions of a small few that are not in line with our values. 
as a country or as, a, as an economy or, or whatever have you. And I, and I think that we broad brush it, and as a result, you have to deal with it and reinforce mm -hmm. that confidence. Mm -hmm. I, I, I often say it, it takes 20 years, 50 years, to build up that kind of respect and that culture and that confidence. Mm -hmm. It takes one person in one minute to blow it. And when you have an organization like ours, 50,000 people strong, you know what, people are messy. Mm -hmm. And there's all kinds of things that happen. You have all kinds of issues. We're bigger than some villages. I think we're bigger than Westlake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, what, and Westlake has a fire department, a police department, a hospital, whatever mm -hmm. have you. And if you just think about it in that context, we have all kinds of issues. So, no matter what you say, no matter what you do, there's going to be someone out there that could do it wrong. Mm -hmm. And you just have to do the best that you can to reinforce it, to drive the culture, mm -hmm. to send the messaging, um, and, and live by example. Yeah. Questions? What does Deloitte look for in hiring new recruits out of college, please? Great question. Great question. Um, <laughs> so first off, uh, yeah, we want the smartest, right? Uh, and we want the broadest, so we want the person that can contribute the most in not just the area of discipline, but broadly speaking. So we're looking for people who not only are, are smart, but have business savvy, perhaps have international experience, uh, both either living <coughs> abroad or, or speaking another language or uh, having had a, a semester abroad or something like that. We're looking for breadth of cultural sensitivity and, and knowledge. Uh, we're looking for people who have leadership skills for tomorrow. Uh, we're, we're all about leadership, and we want individuals who demonstrate uh, both in their resume and in their interviews and in their actions that they have the, the attributes to be a, an outstanding leader. Um, you know, uh, my I have two, two sons, I said. One, uh, the older one is very extroverted, very socially adept. Uh, in an interview, he'll wow you. My younger one is very quiet, very introverted, hardly speaks. But when he does, he says great things. But he has a hard time getting a job. My older son has no problem getting a job. Hmm. And, and I think uh, the, the person that we're looking for uh, could be either one of those. But it's easier to find them in my older son's uh, case than it is in my younger son's case. And so being able to really discern, you know, does this person really have the goods, even though they might be a little bit quiet or, or whatever, um, and how do you figure that out? Well, you know, what questions does the individual ask in the interview? You can't imagine how important that is. Um, and, and while um, you, you don't pick somebody based on the questions that they ask, I can assure you, you don't pick somebody if there are no questions, or the questions demonstrate a lack of preparedness or a lack of knowledge about Deloitte. We want people who want Deloitte. And when they come in and they talk about something generic, or they don't talk about something that's Deloitte, but is something they heard about from one of our competitors, we can figure that out pretty quickly. And, and so we want that passion, mm -hmm. a passion for what, what they do. Um, I don't know, that's, that's what comes to my mind uh, at the moment. Uh, I, I would tell you, having said that, uh, it's a buyer's world, not a seller's world. And, and so you're more in the driver's seat if you're a student than you think. There's less of you than you think. There's certainly less of you than, than what we need. Uh, and, and the students today that are coming out of great schools like here are very smart. They're very well-founded. Uh, and, and we'd love to hire, you know, all of them, all of them. Uh, and so you have, you have a, I think you're in a great position right now. I think there was another one there, yeah. Huh? yeah. I'll decide my accounting is swinging in terms of January 4th. I'm quite excited about it. My question for you is, why do Deloitte value diversity so much than any other accounting firms that I personally know or I have experienced this one year? Tone and attitude of the CEO. <laughs> I, I, I would say, you know, every firm understands it. Every firm believes in it. It's, it's a matter of how you drive the culture of the firm to actually implement it and demonstrate. 
and, and some firms it's harder based upon culture. Some firms have uh, conflicting priorities and so some can get lost. For us, commitment to diversity broadly is what we call a non-negotiable. When, when, when the environment got tough, we didn't take our foot off the pedal because we know how important and ingrained uh, it is to the future of our business. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'd like to say we're more enlightened, but, you know, we all commit to it. Uh, and it's a matter of who walks the talk better, who really drives consistency and sustainable actions uh, to further that. And I'd like to think we do. We get recognized quite a bit for it. And I always tell our people, we get recognized for it uh, at a level higher than what we deserve because we still have an awfully long way to go. While we have the right culture and the right commitment, we still got a lot of work to do. Um, and, and so I appreciate your recognition of that. Welcome to the firm, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I, I feel that uh, it's all about uh, keeping your foot on the pedal. And it is about. I think the CEO, the leadership of any organization that's going to drive that culture. Like that. Other questions? Chance, but one or, one or two more. Yes? Do you see any real possibility of, of tax reform, uh, serious tax reform? And if so, how would that affect your business? So at so, any time that there is legislative reform of any kind, we tend to do well, right? <laughs> I mean, we have a bunch of consultants. Accountants that, that provide advice on all of these issues. And when, let's take Dodd Frank bill for a moment, the, I think the bill is 500 pages in length, and, and there's no doubt there'll be 5,000 pages of regulations. Well, or interpretations or whatever have you. But in that kind of environment, you need the help of consultants. So when you have complex reform uh, legislatively uh, enacted, uh, it, it helps our business quite a bit. The flip of that is when that's directed at us, that increases our compliance, it increases our internal focus on meeting the regulatory demands, and so that has a counterbalance. Um, and, and so it has both its pluses and minuses. Specifically with respect to tax, I, I, there's gonna be tax legislation. I just can't tell you what it is. I mean, if you read the, the output of the two chairmen of the, of the fiscal committee, I mean, the, the latest was, you know, get rid of mortgage tax deduction uh, reinstitute a higher capital gains tax rate, lower the overall federal rates. I mean, I think that was a shock to the system when we heard that, but what it did, I think, was demonstrate to the community at large that these guys are very serious about some form of tax reform. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty dramatic changes uh, to the fundamentals of our tax system. And I, so I, I do think that there's going to be uh, some. I, I cannot predict what it will be. Uh, because I know that the moment I do that, the next chapter in the book will be something totally opposite. Sure. So I, I don't, I, I won't do that. But it is, um, it is something that I, I think we need. I, I think uh, there's an, enough chatter about it uh, that we have to have some things substantive uh, that will be helpful to the issue at hand. Um, and hopefully uh, it will be. But I, I can't predict what it will be, but we will have the tax reform. One more question. Two. Two. Two questions. A lot of clients, I was wondering, when do you think that convergence to international standards is going to come about, and how will it compare to the other standards? You know, when I gave a, a, a speech a, a while ago about IFRS, um, I, I euphemistically called it IFRS, and I said, no, it isn't IFRS, it's WENERS. <laughs> And, and I still believe that. Um, but I will tell you that the, the political um, issues associated with the US adopting IFRS is still pretty strong. Um, from those that are in power suggesting that constituencies are saying, why are we doing this? To mm -hmm. the potential loss of power and control by US regulators uh, when that would be ultimately implemented. And so, what I do know is, in, in the world in which we're operating today, the political agenda has a much higher weight than some of the other agendas uh, that, that, that perhaps should, but don't. And so I, I, I can't predict when, 
uh, but I do know that the journey is being taken and the analysis continuing to be had, and I do believe it's, it's a question of when as opposed to if. But uh, I think that there's two, that, you know, convergence is very different than adoption, and there are those that believe we should adopt IFRS and there should be one single set of standards. The convergence, which is the question that you asked, mm -hmm. will suggest that it converges, but we'll have multiple sets of, today we have multiple sets of IFRS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what will it ultimately be, I don't know, but, but I think in the near term it's more likely to be convergence, uh, and the ultimate game plan, I hope, would be more adoption but I think uh, it's going to be a little bit longer than we might have otherwise thought because of the political agenda. Deloitte uh, has offices all around the world, and many of those uh, countries in which we operate have already adopted IFRS. And so we've already sort of deployed resources in a center of excellence kind of concept to make sure that we are ready uh, for our own uh, providing of services uh, in those countries, and the U.S. will undoubtedly leverage those resources and leverage the already desired infrastructure in order to be able to do the same uh, in the U.S. Additionally, you know, we're providing materials for schools uh, to teach IFRS uh, because obviously it's going to be a big deal. Uh, I was, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a good example of what I mean by that, not in the school context, <coughs> but the Internal Revenue Service happens to be a large client of Deloitte uh, from a consulting perspective. And when I was talking with the then commissioner um, a couple of years ago, when IFRS was first becoming uh, important, I asked her, you know, what's, their, what's her biggest challenge? And, and she said to me, IFRS. And I, you know, for the moment, I, I didn't get it. This, this is the IRS commissioner. And I said, can you, can you explain that? And she said to me, training my agents on IFRS. So there's a huge education requirement here that's needed, and part of our preparation is to engage as broadly as we can with clients, with our own people, uh, with inst you know, educational institutions to help uh, get ready for that. But, but we're, we're, not, you know, we're not unprepared. Uh, we tend not to be for things like that, but we are uh, yet far away from a full implementation. One last question. Um, as the economy becomes more global, what opportunities and threats do you see with that? And are y'all focusing on a certain country to expand y'all to certain? Yeah, so there's no, first off, it's not a, that's also not a matter of if, it's a, it's a matter of now. Because uh, our economy is definitely interconnected more than it has ever been. The global economic crisis demonstrated that very clearly. Uh, and so globalization is both a big opportunity and a potential threat if you don't deal with it in the right way. Uh, and so. Uh, first off, uh, we are definitely committed to uh, internationalizing our individual people's behavior. Um, for the most part, people are country-centric, uh, no matter where you are in the world, but certainly in the U.S., people are much more country-centric than they are uh, in other parts of the world. And so we have to embark upon an attitude, uh, a culture building, an awareness that uh, the world is bigger than, than your little market. And with clients all becoming more multinational in focus, we need to really drive that quickly. Uh, so I, I think that that's a big opportunity, but there's a threat there that if you don't do it fast enough, uh, you, know, you, you will miss the opportunity and miss the boat. The markets that we're focused on outside the US are the traditional brick markets. That's Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China. Uh, clearly for us, all four are extremely important, growing, and opportunistic. Additionally, uh, the places where we believe opportunity is great for the future is the Middle East, in Vietnam, Turkey, Northern Africa, uh, Indonesia. There's, there's, there's lots of other emerging markets that we see uh, developing strength uh, in business, in particular in financial services, uh, that we will continue to invest in and drive. Uh, our focus is going to be uh, not only investing in those markets, but also deployments. Uh, and so in order to have deployment to some of those markets, we're looking for people who are bilingual, uh, in Chinese in particular, uh, in, in Russian. Uh, we, we need people that are willing to move to these places. They're not all the most 
luxurious places in the world to live, but the opportunity is enormous, uh, and, and we're going to be investing in our people's deployment uh, in, order, in order to do that. I, would, I mentioned earlier, I would really love um, to hire people who are multilingual. And that's not easy in this country. It's really easy in another country. But in the US, uh, most people are singularly uh, English speaking. And we need people that speak Mandarin. We need people that speak um, Russian, German. Uh, it, these are, if we had people that were like that, um, th their deployment would be, and their, their value to our firm would be just really high. An extraordinary visit from an extraordinary leader. Thank you. Gary Salzburg, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you.